Hey students, welcome to lecture number 14 of multiple zeta values and modular forms. So last time we introduced multiple Eisenstein series, which were a multiple version of classical Eisenstein series, and these were defined for numbers k1 up to kr, which are greater or equal to 2. And today we want to continue talking about these multiple Eisenstein series, and more precisely we want to talk about um, regularized multiple Eisenstein series, by which we mean we want to make sense of these objects when these uh, numbers k1 up to kr are greater or equal to 1. So, but first um, we will recall what we did last time. So last time um, we considered these multiple Eisenstein series and calculated their Fourier expansion, and today we will introduce these um, shuffle regularized multiple Eisenstein series, and these, this will be done by comparing a coproduct on a certain space of so-called formal iterated integrals to the Fourier expansion of multiple Eisenstein series. And what we will do is we will um, calculate this coproduct by considering these types of diagrams you see here. And then for a group of diagrams, um, we can also um, associate to this um, a part in this calculation of the Fourier expansion we did last time. Okay, but first um, let's recall the definition of multiple Eisenstein series. But first, um, so to define these multiple Eisenstein series, we introduced an order on this lattice z tau z, where tau is an element in the upper half plane. And then we said a lattice point lambda 1 is greater than a lattice point lambda 2 when it's on the right or above uh, of lambda 2. So for example, um, this point here is smaller than this point, but it's also smaller than this point, uh, and so on. And with this, we then def um, saw that the classical Oops. The classical Eisenstein series, GK, um, these were then given by the sum over all uh, positive uh, lattice points. And this made sense for all um, K greater or equal to 2, where in the case when K is 2, we need to use this um, Eisenstein summation. And then we saw that um, these, for all K, also for odd K, had a Fourier expansion where the constant term was given by uh, by zeta k, and then um, the rest was given by our q series g up to some power of 2 pi i. So in general, then, um, we defined the multiple version by considering multiple sums of lattice points. So the multiple Eisenstein series was then defined by this ordered sums of lattice points here, so where this k1 is greater or equal to 3 to make this sum absolutely convergent, but we could also make sense of this sum in the case when k1 is equal to 2. And then because we we fixed an, an order of summation where we first sum in the horizontal axis and then on the vertical line, and therefore this object here is defined uh, for all numbers greater or equal to 2. And then as I so said before, in depth 1, um, this gives the classical Eisenstein series where the Fourier expansion is given by the zeta value and our Q series G. And this part here we then denoted by uh, G hat of K. And in general, we then defined the, the hat version of our Q series G by just multiplying um, with this power of 2 pi i. Because the statement was that uh, any multiple Eisenstein series can be written as a multi zeta linear combination of these G hats. So more precisely, any multiple Eisenstein series G, um, k1 up to kr for all numbers greater equal to 2, can be written like this. So the constant term is just the corresponding zeta value, and here at the end we have the corresponding uh, g hat. And in between we have a mix of this g hat and these zeta values, where here in the mixed part um, the, the depths of these two objects are strictly smaller than r. So the only depth r part is really this g hat of the same index, and this constant term here. So for example, um, we had this example here with the triple Eisenstein series g is 3 to 2. Here we have zeta 3 to 2 and this g hat 3 to 2. And in between we have a mix here of double zeta values and uh, single g hats. And here we have a mix of um, single zeta values and double g hats. And so the, what was the idea to to calculate this form here. So for this we did the following. So um, 
instead of writing these multiple Eisenstein series as a sum over ordered lattice points, we wrote them as a sum over all tuples in this um, P, where P was the set of positive lattice points, meaning the, the, the lattice points at the upper half plane and the points on the positive real axis. And then instead of summing over ordered lattice points, we could sum here, uh, replacing this lambda 1 by the sum of the first of all of these uh, elements in this tuple, and then this lambda 2 we can replace by the sum of all up um, without uh, lambda 1. And then clearly this one here is greater than this one. And the last one here you cannot see because it's, it's in the background. The last one here is just a lambda r to the kr. So this is clearly the same. And then we could distinguish the dif different cases where these lambdas are in. So this p is a union of the set u and r. And therefore this lambda, this lambda j could be either in u and r. And therefore we introduce this notation here this g a1 up to ar, where these uh, a1 up to ar, and they are either r or u. And this just means that, uh, so if, um, uh, that the lambda j is in the set aj. And then clearly the, the, we get back the multiple Eisenstein series if we sum over all possible choices of these a1 up to ar. So for example, in depth one, there are just two choices. So we just have one A, it could be R or U. And then this R term gives exactly the, uh, oops, the zeta K. And the U term, so this means we sum over all um, elements in the upper half plane. So we could say we, we sum over all possible positive M's And then for a fixed M, we can sum over all lattice points on this level. But this just meant that we sum here over all integers N and Z. So this is 1 over M tau plus N to the K. And this part here, we denoted by Psi K of M of tau. And then by the Lipschitz uh, summation formula, which is this one here, which makes a statement about this Psi K. So this is Psi K of of tau, we could rewrite this uh, by using this formula here, and then this whole thing just became mm, so minus 2 pi i k of the g k. And um, <clears throat> in general, the connection of this g hat in arbitrary depth and these, um, so these functions we call the monotangent functions. Um, the connection of this g hat to this monotangent function was given as follows. So every time I have an ordered sum over m's and I take the product here of monotangent function psi k1 m1 tau up to psi kr mr tau, then this gives exactly the g hat. Yes, and the proof was just given by, uh, by using this Lipschitz summation formula here, because then we get here exactly our definition of our small g. So again, in depth one, we then get this. And in depth two, so um, we got the following. So um, in depth two, we have these four cases, RR, UR, RU, and UU. So every time we had two R, everything in R, this just gave the zeta value. Every time we just have everything in U, um, we get the G hat, because uh, everything in U just means that um, that these two lambdas here are both in U. So I have a, a sum like this. So for each um, of these lattice points, I can have an M. So M1 and M2. So I can take a sum over M1 is greater than M2. And for a fixed M, I again have these monotangent. And therefore, um, I get a sum like this. So this here is always um, G hat, K1, K2. Then if I have a word ending in R, meaning the first, well, the, the second um, lattice point here is in R, meaning I have a sum starting here and then I get some point here. But this just means I take the sum over all lattice points here on the positive real axis, which just gives a zeta value. And then I still have um, this part here, which just gives us a small g. So ending in R just means I can split up this zeta value, zeta k, and here I have g hat k1. And then the problem was uh, this part here. 
So this gave a sum um, over um, positive m. So because uh, if the word ends in u, I get something here, and then I sum these two lattice points on the same level of m. So I can take the sum over all positive m, and then for a fixed m, I sum over ordered n1 and n2. And this, um, so this here we have an n1 is greater than oops, n2, and both of them are just integers. <coughs> and this sum here we called psi k1 k2 of uh, m tau, which was an example of a so-called uh, uh, multi-tangent function. So in general these multi-tangent functions were given by by sum of exactly this shape here. So for fixed uh, k1 up to kr, psi k1 up to kr of x is given by this sum here, where we sum over ordered integers, so they are real, so they are all possible. So they, they could also be negative, so they don't need to be greater or equal to uh, 1. And, um, and then the main statement was that whenever I have a multi-tangent function, we have this theorem here, um, which said that any multi-tangent function can be written as a multi-zeta linear combination of these monotangent functions. And therefore this sum here um, I can, can write as a multi-zeta linear combination of monotangent functions and therefore this sum here becomes again a multi-zeta linear combination of g hat. So <clears throat> let's do one example um, which we will use later. Um, so again Let's do here the case um, G32. So recall this is then G32RR plus G32UR plus G32RU. Plus G32UU. Oh, without a comma here. So, um, so the first gives zeta three two. Then here this is um, g hat three zeta two plus, and here we have uh, m greater equal greater zero than of psi three two m tau plus, and the last term here gives g hat three two. And now um, we need to write this. Um, Multi this double tangent function here in terms of monotangent, and this we also did last time as an example. This psi three two by definition is this, and then you sh using partial fraction decomposition um, inside the sum we get this term here, where this part here cancels out, and the rest gives this here. So we can now replace this this um, multi tangent here by this expression here. And therefore we get, um, oh, maybe just do it here. So this can be written as, or maybe do this the whole sum. So this sum here, we can replace this by this. But um, the first term, if I replace this by psi 2, then I have an ordered sum over monotangent. So this just gives g hat 2. So this gives 3 times zeta 3 times g hat 2 plus and here the psi 3 will become a g hat 3. So this is zeta 2 g hat 3. And therefore I have twice, 2 times this g hat 3 times zeta 2. So in total we get this here. Because then we, we add them up and we get this. And the constant term is this. And this g hat is this guy here with a bracket. Okay, and this example um, we will use later. And um, so for the so in general this calculation here, so this is done by using partial fraction decomposition, and therefore there are explicit formulas for this. And therefore in general for this theorem here on the Fourier expansion, you can also give explicit formulas in arbitrary depths. Um, but last time we just presented the ones um, for the depths two and depths three. So in depth 2, 
in general, the Fourier expansion of double Eisenstein series is given by this formula here, um, where these three parts are again clear, and this part here comes ex in comes from this um, writing this psi k1 k2 in terms of monotangent functions, and you see that in the formula we have a binomial coefficients which just come from the general formula uh, for the partial fraction decomposition, uh, which we used at this place here. And also in DEF3 you can write this down explicitly if you want, um, but you, if you look at the formula, this is maybe not something you really want to do. Um, but in general, if you look in the paper of me and then Tasaka, you can also find um, formulas uh, for arbitrary DEFs, um, at least for these um, G uh, with, uh, with some letters on top. Okay, so now today um, we want to do the following. So these multiple Eisenstein series, they were defined for all integers uh, greater or equal to 2, and they had a Fourier expansion where the constant term was a multiple zeta value of the same index, and then they had some uh, Fourier expansion here where the coefficients are given by uh, multi-zetas and some power of pi i, so on. So this means that these ans are in this space here, because even powers of pi are multiple zeta values, and uh, odd powers um, give some some complex number here, so they are elements um, where the real, they are complex numbers where the real part is a multi zeta and the imaginary part is um, pi times some multi zeta. But the natural question now is um, so these multiple zeta values are defined not just for these indices, I mean they are defined for all admissible indices, meaning that um, these k2 up to kr can be greater or equal to 1. And then the natural question is. Uh, can we extend this definition here of these multiple Eisenstein series um, such that we get um, a nice function, whatever this means, uh, which also has um, a Fourier expansion like this, where the constant term is given by the corresponding multiple zeta value. And um, so to rephrase this uh, question, let's first recall the following. So these multiple Eisenstein series, by definition, they satisfied the Staffel product formula because they were also just defined um, by an ordered sum. Um, so by this I mean that, for example, if I multiply G3 with G4, I can just use um, this Staffel product formula. So therefore, um, we can view them as some, some algebra homomorphism. But first, for this, we need to introduce the following. So, recall we had this um, notation of this H1, which was given by um, all linear Q linear combination of words in this let in this um, letters um, in these letters uh, that one that two and so on. So this was uh, Q the non-commutative polynomial ring in Z2 that that one that two and so on. And for this, we can consider the subspace H2, um, which are now a linear combination of words in the letters um, Z2, Z3. So it doesn't contain a Z1. So you can think of these elements being linear combination or corresponding to linear combination of multiple Eisenstein series, um, because an index K1 up to Kr corresponds to the word ZK1 up to ZKr. And then um, we can um, um, so first of all, it's clear that this H2 um, with the Staffel product is um, is closed under the Staffel product, so we get a subalgebra of this H1 with this Staffel product, and therefore we can view these uh, multiple Eisenstein series <coughs> as a, an algebra homomorphism from this H2 Staffel to the space of um, of series of this shape here. And then you can ask, um, so we can then rephrase this question here, if we can extend this map um, to the space uh, H1. But on H1 we not, didn't just have the, the, the Staffel product, but there we also had the Shuffle product. So we might ask the following, can we extend this map here from H2 to the space of Q series um, as follows? Um, in, a, in such a way that we get algebra homomorphism from H1 bullet, where bullet is now either stuffle or shuffle, 
um, such that they um, generalize these classical Eisenstein series, meaning that if we restrict this new map to the subspace H2, that we get um, these classical Eisenstein series. And um, the answer to this question is, uh, in both cases, for both bullets is yes. So in the case when this bullet is the shuffle, so this is yes, this is due to Tasaka, Koji Tasaka and myself. So we can define um, a G shuffle, which is an algebra homomorphism um, from H1 shuffle to, well, to the space here. And for the case Staffel, um, the answer is also, it's almost yes, um, but we cannot really extend it to whole H1, but we can extend it to H0. Um, but there's also a, a restricted version, um, so this is due to myself in my thesis. So there's a map G Staffel, which still depends on some integer m, and then this is an algebra homomorphism from H1. Stuffel also to the space, and the limit um, m goes to infinity of this guy here makes sense whenever you evaluate it at a word in H0. So recall H0 was a subspace of H1, and this correspond to all admissible indices. And here the notation is a little bit confusing, so we had this H1, which is the larger space inside, the, we have the H0, which um, corresponds to all words starting, not starting in Z1, uh, and inside this we have this H2. So this here is standard notation, and this too I just choose because uh, it makes sense to, to call it H2, because we, um, we start by with a 2 here. Okay, anyways, um, we can extend this map for the Staffel product uh, to this space, but um, there's also a version which depends on some integer m, which basically means we restrict the summation on the on the vertical line by m, and then we can define an algebra homomorphism from this space to here um, for all words. But today um, we will just um, talk about this this shuffle regularized version here, and this you can find uh, in the lecture notes. Okay, so. But the main idea behind the, these two constructions are basically the same. Um, so for for bullet being either stuffle or shuffle, we will define algebra homomorphisms, um, which we call G hat um, bullet. So these will be algebra homomorphisms from H1 um, bullet to, to this space here. And then there will be two Hopf algebra structures on this H1 shuffle, and one will be on this H1 stuffle. So here, on this shuffle side, there will be so-called Goncharov coproduct. Coproduct. And here we will have the so-called deconcatenation nation coproduct. And then the idea to construct this algebra homomorphism, this G shuffle from H1 shuffle to our target space here, is to first um, use this coproduct. So this will give an element here in H1 shuffle, tensor H1 shuffle. And then on the left hand side, we will use this algebra homomorphism here. And on the right hand side, we will use the shuffle regularized multiple zeta base. So on the right hand side, we will land in the space of multiple zeta base. And on the left hand side, we will land in this space here. And then we can just multiply both of them to, to land here. So by construction, because every step here is an algebra homomorphism, um, we get that this is an algebra homomorphism because uh, we define this map by, by going this way here. But then the surprising theorem is that um, doing this here will lead um, to this theorem here that um, if we restrict this map to the subspace H2, then we get back our original multiple Eisenstein series. And this we will demonstrate today. So what we need to do is we need to compare this Gonshaw coproduct um, to this um, Fourier expansion we calculated last time. And this is also the same idea for the 
for the stuff will regularize multiple um, zeta values where we do exactly the same we use this this coproduct here which is now a coproduct uh, with respect to the stuffer product so we land in this space here on the left hand side we use um, an algebra homomorphism with respect um, to the stuffer product and on the right hand side the stuffer regularized multiple zeta values and then go here and therefore this is an algebra homomorphism and also there you can check that if you restrict this to h2 then this gives back the classical multiple zeta values. But this side is less surprising than this, because this is basically um, here coming this coming from the so in particular this definition of this G hat stuffle is exactly coming from this um, Fourier from this calculation of the Fourier expansion we did before. But this part here is um, quite surprising, and that's why I choose to talk about this in this lecture here. Okay, so to define this Goncha of coproduct, so this coproduct will be defined on the space of so-called formal iterated intervals. So let's first recall uh, iterated integrals, which we did in section 2. So for example, this zeta 2, 3, we were able to write this as this iterated integrals here. So this has weight 5, and therefore we have an iterated integral here of length 5, meaning we have 5 differential forms here. And so this um, usual notation for this is also uh, given by i. And here we will we have an iterative integral starting in 1 and ending in 0. <coughs> and in between, we have two types of uh, differential forms. And this part here cor will correspond to a 0, and this to a 1, this to a 0, 0, and 1. So this iterated integral here will correspond to the following symbol. Um, oops, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1. And um, we also saw that these iterated integrals, if we multiply them with each other, then we can, um, we can view these two types of differential forms as two types of cards, and then we can shuffle them together. So using this iterated integral expression, we showed that these multiple zeta values satisfy the shuffle product formula. So what we will introduce now is an um, is a are formal symbols of exactly this form here. So they will be symbols like this, um, having some zeros and ones in the middle, and then the product will be given by shuffling uh, these indices uh, into each other. So more precisely. Um, they are given as follows. So they were introduced uh, by Goncharov, and you can find uh, uh, the reference in the lecture notes. So we consider the, I, the algebra I, the Q-algebra, which is um, generated by these formal symbols, A0 up to An plus 1. So these are somehow the start and end points of the iterated integral. And in between we have A1 up to An. And these Ai's are either 0 or 1. And then we divide out um, the following relations. So first of all, um, we allow that here in the middle we have an empty word, and this will be given. This will give us the, the neutral element in our algebra. And then the product of these guys is, as I said, um, if I multiply two of these formal symbols, <coughs> then so here um, two formal symbols which starts with the same a zero and end with the same um, a here. So then what we do, we um, shuffle these guys in the middle. So this here is just, um, if I would write this as w and this v, um, you can think of this as just, um, here I take the sum over, or here I, I, this whole thing is just a w shuffle v. And then they also satisfy the so-called path composition formula. So all these relations also hold um, for the real versions of these guys, but this is now just a formal formal symbols. So pass composition formula means that if I have an, an iterate integral like this, or this formal symbol here, then um, I can run through each position here and take the sum over all um, these positions and somehow cut this iterated integral at this position and multiply these um, two iterated integrals. And <coughs> And then um, if we start uh, at the same a, which is also here at the end, then this iterated integral um, is zero. And then finally, 
if we invert uh, the order of these words, um, then we get uh, a minus sign here. In particular, these um, show that um, that this product, shuffle product, is defined for all formal symbols. So here it's just defined for formal symbols which start and end in the same letter. But um, if they do not start in the same letter, then I can uh, use this inversion formula here to let them start in the same letter. And if, but if they are both the same, um, then um, one of them is zero by this one here. And so this is a, a Q algebra, the space I here, with with this product and these relations. And um, on this space, Goncharov then defines the following coproduct, which we will denote by delta G. And so the coproduct of this formal iterated integral I A0 up to I up to A uh, N plus one is given by this sum here which if you look at the first time maybe it looks a little bit confusing. Um, so what you do is <clears throat> you take the sum here over all possible choices of um, indices here. Um, so this k here means from these um, uh, n positions, or here from these n positions, you choose um, k of them. And then in the left hand side, you write these down here, uh, the one you, you choose. And on the right hand side, you write down the product um, for the elements between the, your choices. And we will do an example to, to make this uh, clear. And then um, this product, uh, this triple here, so with the shuffle product and this um, co-product, um, this, um, we get a commutative um, graded Hopf algebra over Q. So let's do an example to, to, to make sense of this complicated um, formula. Uh, yeah. So, for example, if we want to calculate the coproduct of um, this formal iterated integral here, so in this case the the capital N is eight, so we have uh, eight here in the middle. So the capital N is eight. Maybe also let's recall here the the definition of coproduct. <clears throat> so, or maybe I put it on top. So here is the definition of the coproduct formula. So here we have the case n equals eight, and now the statement is we need to take the sum over all k going from zero to eight, and we need to choose k of these um, positions here. So in this case, so what you do to, to, to calculate this is you write these numbers a0 up to a9 on, on this half circle here. And then um, if you, you need to choose um, from these eight parts here, you need to choose um, k. So in this case here, k equals three. Oops. So we now choose um, a1, a4, and a7. Uh, so in other words, uh, i1 is 1, i2 is 4, and i3 is 7. So we choose those. And then the formula says that on the left hand side we get the formally iterated integral of the parts we choose. Um, so here it's written down. So the left hand side on the coproduct is a0, a1, a4, a7, a9. So this is exactly <coughs> this here. And on the right hand side we get everything in between. Um, so here we take the iterated integral um, from a0 to a1, which is just 1 by 1 of the um, the relations. And then the next one here is the iterated integral from a1 to a4. And then we take the iterated integral from a4 to a7. And the last one here is the iterated integral from a7 to a9.
And this is just what this formula here says. Um, for each position from 0 to k, we take the, the product of all these um, iterated integrals from a0. So if you start here with p0, we go to a i um, 1, which is a1. And then the next one gives this, and then this, and then this, and then we take the product of all of these, and we get this thing here. And to, to calculate the co-product, you then need to consider all possible um, sums. So you need to consider all possible k. So you start with k equals 0, which means you don't choose anything. So if, um, if k equals 0, um, you just um, have a line like this. So then on the left-hand side, um, you, uh, you don't choose anything. So on the left-hand side, you get a0 empty a9. And on the right-hand side, well, everything in between, so you have a i a0, a1, up to a8, a9. So you get this term. So this one here is just 1. <coughs> So this is 1 tensor, your original input here. And if k equals n, this just means you choose everything. So the other extreme case is that on the left-hand side, you have your original um, formal iterated integral. On the right-hand side, you have 1. OK. <clears throat> but now let's uh, do this really with one explicit example, because we want to compare this to our uh, multiple Eisenstein series. And, but first, um, we will not consider the space i, but we will divide out um, a certain um, ideal, and you will see why. So the space we are interested in, uh, we will denote by i1. So this is our um, space of formally to integral, uh, modulo this ideal here. So this iterated integral here, um, what does this mean? So i <clears throat> 1, 0, 0, this corresponds, so i1 corresponds, so it's not equal because this integral doesn't exist, but this would be the integral m from 0 to 1 of the differential form uh, dt1 minus, uh, dt over t. Um, so in other words, this is well, it's not really, but uh, this corresponds to minus of uh, log 0, um, which doesn't exist. But um, so what we want to do is we want to regularize this logarithm, and he, we want to set this to be uh, 0. <coughs> OK, and um, then um, we use this notation here, the, this usual i. Um, to denote the class um, in this quotient space here of this formally iterated integral. And further, um, we introduce this notation here. Um, so if we have an iterated integral starting at 1 and ending in 0, uh, so every iterated integral can be written like this because we can uh, reverse the order or we can, or otherwise it's, it's 0 if the start and end point is both 1 or both 0. And then we can say here that if I start with k minus 1 uh, zeros and I have 1 here, then this is, I say, k1. And then in the end, um, I have uh, n zeros here. And then this we denote by i n uh, k1 up to kr. And uh, yes, so a any element in this um, i1 can be written in this form here. Okay, so, and then for these guys, uh, we have the following proposition, which you can find in the work uh, together with the Tasaka. And so, first, if uh, if I have i n of the empty index, meaning that uh, I don't have k's here, meaning everything here is zero, so i 1 up to, so, so what is i n empty? This is just uh, i 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, where I have n zeros here. So this is 0 if n uh, is greater or equal to 1. 
or 1 if n is 0, because then it's just a, it's a neutral element. And um, any of these i, where I have some n here, can be written as a linear combination of these i's uh, without an n. And by this, without an n, um, so I should have said, so i k1 up to kr, we define this to be i0 of k1 up to kr. So in other words, um, any iterated integral in this quotient space where I have some zeros at the end here, um, I can always write as a linear combination of iterated integrals without zeros at the end. And therefore, um, if this is true, um, these elements without zeros at the end, so these here, they form a basis of our space i1. And this basically just means that this i1 is the same as, so we can identify this uh, with our h1, um, because both have bases given by, uh, given by these indices where ki are greater or equal to 1. And more precisely, this um, as a Q-algebra, this is isomorphic to this, well, I don't know, to this H1 with the shuffle product, um, because the shuffle product on this H1 is exactly the shuffle product on this I1 here with respect to this basis. But let's first do one example um, for this proposition here. So um, if I have some iterated integral ending in zero, why can I write this as an iterated integral without zero at the end? So for this, um, for example, consider this case here. Um, if I multiply, uh, so this is um, the, the element we divide out here. So this is so this is zero, and that's why this product with anything is zero. And for example, if we multiply it with this guy, which is i two, um, then. So how is the product defined here? So the shuffle product, we need to shuffle the zero into here. So the zero could be either there or there, which gives two times i1, 0, 0, 1. Or um, the zero could be here at the end. So i1, 0, 1, 0. So this here is i1, so there's one zero at the end, 2, and this is i3. And therefore, um, because this is zero, we can see that we can write this i1, 2 um, as this i3, or more precisely, it's a minus, so i1, 2 is just minus 2 times um, i3. And in general, this is exactly here, the, the main idea, the general idea, that if we shuffle with this guy here, we can get a one zero here at the end, uh, and then inductively we see that we can always remove these zeros here, and these binomial coefficients just come uh, from these shuffling parts. Okay, and therefore we get that this space, uh, this, el this these elements here form a basis of our h of our i one, and then clearly this. Um, the vector space which has this as a basis is isomorphic to the vector space h1, but also the product on this space um, i1 is exactly the, the shuffle product on this h1. So these two algebras are the same. And also, <coughs> which I didn't mention here, but this Gonshaw-Hoff coproduct, so this here is in co-ideal, and one can show that with with the same formula here by replacing these these i's by, by usual i's, and we also get a uh, um, Hopf algebra. And therefore, this we can define this coproduct on this space H1 shuffle. Okay, so, but now let's do one explicit example. So let's calculate the coproduct of, um, of I32. So this means we need to calculate the coproduct of this former symbol here. 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. And for this, we need to consider diagrams of this shape here, where by this black dot we mean 1, and by the white dot we mean 0. So this is 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. And now we want to consider all possible choices of these points here. 
So our capital N in this case is 5, because we can choose any of these 5 points here. And we want to group them in a way, depending on uh, which of these black dots we, we choose. Um, so the first part is the following, where we don't, do not choose any of these uh, black dots. And the statement is that there's just one uh, non-trivial contribution to the coproduct, which is given by by this diagram here. So what does this diagram uh, give? So on the left hand side is um, everything we choose. So on the left hand side we have, well we just choose this and this. So we have i um, 1 0 which by, by the relations is 1. And on the right hand side is everything in between. So this is i 1 0 0, 1, 0, 1, oh, 0. So this is just 1 tensor i, 3, 2. <coughs> and every other choice, so for example, if I would, um, so here we consider all diagrams where we do not choose um, these two dots. So but what, what about, for example, this one here? Well, this would correspond to, um, on the left hand side we would choose uh, oops, 1, 0, uh, 0, 0 um, but this is 0 because this is just i2 yes and this we said uh, to be we have here in the proposition is 0 and also every other choice uh, uh, without black dots um, would give zero on the left hand side and therefore the only contribution of these types of choosings um, will give this in the coproduct. And now um, what about the cases where we choose the first black dot and then the claim is this diagram here is the only contribution to our um, co-product. So what is on the on the left hand side is everything we choose. So we choose 1, 0, 0, 1, um, 0. And on the right hand side we choose um, the, the product of everything in between. Um, so here in, if I have um, neighbors the, the thing in between is always 1. So the only interesting part here is this um, iterative integral, which is 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0. So on the left hand side we have i3 and on the right hand side we have i2. And also here you can check that this is really the only diagram which gives something non-zero. So for example if we ch would choose this, what is this? Uh, why is this zero? Well, this would be zero because on the left hand side we would have um, the product contains the iterated integral from from zero to zero, which is zero. So this is uh, this would give zero on the right hand side. So therefore, this here is the only uh, contribution to the coproduct in this case where we consider the markings with one black dot here. And now um, the markings with the second black dot. Uh, so the claim is we we have these three diagrams which give non-zero contribution. So here the first, um, this one on the left hand side is everything we choose. Uh, 1, 0, 1, 0. On the right hand side we have the product of everything in between. This times this times this. And then um, this one gives this part. And this one here gives this part. And then um, we see that here this is i2, here these two are 1 and 1, and this is i3, so the first part gives this. Um, here on the left hand side we have um, this, but um, here we can, uh, yeah, we have uh, this i2 on the left hand side, and on the right hand side, um, we have um, this here. Here this is 1 and this is 1, 
And this guy here, so it goes from 1 to 0, but we can use the pass inversion, which gives a minus sign. So this is why this minus sign is there. And then we get i starting with a 2 and ending with 1, 0. So this is i, 1, 2. And here, um, on the left-hand side, we have i, 3. And here, this is 1, 1, 1. And this just gives um, i, 2. And maybe there should also be a 1. Okay, so, and now um, here we can use um, the formula we had before. So we have now an i here with a 1. So this is minus 2 times this. So in total, we get um, that this is, so here we have, um, this is plus 2 times um, I2 tensor I3. So we get that this is 3 times I2 tensor I3 plus I3 tensor I2. And also you can check that these are really the only elements which give non-zero contribution when we choose the second one. So for example this, 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 well, this is this. Uh, if you take this, 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 then this would be zero because here um, this term would give a zero on the right hand side. Okay, so now the last case is when we actually choose both um, black dots. And then the statement is this is the only diagram where we choose both, both black dots. And this gives, well, we choose everything and therefore the left hand side is i um, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, and on the right hand side is uh, well just 1, so this gives i 3, 2, 1. And so we have these four cases, and now we can add everything up, and we get the following. So the coproduct we just calculated is exactly this formula here. And now we can compare this um, formula to our um, Fourier expansion of the double Eisenstein series G32. So this should be 32. And we see that if we compare them, then they look quite similar. So here, if you look the right hand side here, I32, appears here at zeta 3, 2, and here i3 appears at, as zeta 3, and here i2 appears as zeta 2, and here, well, 1 appears at, at 1, and on the left hand side, here this i2 appears at g hat 2, and i3 appears at g hat 3, and i3 2 on the left hand side appears at g hat 3, 2, and the coefficients here are exactly the same, so this 3 and this too. And also if you look closely then you see that um, choosing both black dots here gives in this formula here, so which just gave this part, uh, this corresponded exactly to, um, to the g u u, 3 2, then this part here where we um, choose the second black dot and not the first one, this corresponded exactly to g r u 3 2 and here in this case where we mark the first one this corresponds to the term which we got from g u r 3 2 and here this part corresponded to g r r 3 2. So in other words um, these parts um, coming from these um, from these Fourier expansion and these coproducts, these words in R somehow, uh, which black dot we choose here corresponds um, to uh, if these letters are U. So in the case when we don't choose any black dot, then th no letter is U. If we choose the first black dot, then the first letter is U. 
if we choose the second black dot, the second letter is U, and if we choose both black dots, then both letters are U. And this is actually true uh, in general, if you compare this calculation of the Fourier expansion um, and this coproduct, then this phenomena here um, will, will appear in an arbitrary case. And so, um, so therefore, um, uh, well, what does this mean? So, with this, um, uh, so, uh, so in other words, in what this this comparison here means is that this uh, G three two um, is the same as if I take the coproduct of I three two. And then on the right, right hand side I apply the zeta map, and on the left hand side I apply this um, g hat, and then I just multiply them. Then we see that we have uh, this equality here, which we can see in this picture here. And the statement is that for arbitrary indices um, this equality is true. And then um, we can extend this definition of these multiple Eisenstein series. So, so these um, formally theoretical integrals, they, they are defined for all indices. And um, so also this coproduct is defined for all indices. So the right hand side here uh, makes sense for all indices. But we need to be careful because here's a zeta value. Um, we need to then uh, use a shuffle regularized multiple zeta value. So in this case here, uh, it doesn't matter because all indices are admissible. And on the left hand side, um, even though this g hat is defined for all indices, uh, we also want that this is really an algebra homomorphism with respect to the shuffle product, uh, which is not the case. So we really need to um, find an extension of this map um, such that this is an algebra homomorphism and in a such a way that this g hat shuffle is our original g hat in the case when all indices are greater or equal to 2, so that this picture here um, doesn't get destroyed. And this is exactly um, what we want to sketch now. Um, so this will be really just a sketch, and you can see the exact construction in the lecture notes. So to define this g hat shuffle, we first define a g shuffle, and then the hat just means, again, multiplying with the power of 2 pi i. So what we want to construct is an algebra homomorphism G shuffle from H1 shuffle um, to the space of um, formal power series with rational coefficients. So meaning, so if this is an algebra homomorphism with respect to the shuffle product, um, this for example in depth 1 means that this G shuffle um, satisfies the shuffle product, meaning they satisfy this formula here for K1 and K2 greater or equal to 1, and K here is um, <clears throat> K1 plus K2. And we saw that our usual G, without the shuffle, because we didn't define what the shuffle is yet, they satisfy a similar formula up to some, some extra terms. So more precisely what we saw earlier is that our classical G, our small G, satisfies this formula, but we had some extra term here. And the idea is now, um, so what we want is we um, we want to define this G shuffle in such a way that um, for all indices greater equal to 2, we want this to be, uh, so want G shuffle K1, KR equals G K1 up to KR if all entries are greater equal to 2 because then um, this comparison with the coproduct before um, gives exactly our classical multiple Eisenstein series. And um, therefore, if we look at this here, uh, what we want to do is we want to define our G shuffle in depth one. We just take our usual G shuffle, and then these garbage terms, we will just um, put, so this these guys here, we will put in the definition of G shuffle um, k1, k minus 1. And um, so, and then the, the remaining g's we will just define 
um, to be the, the classical G's. So, so, no, so what we can do here in this example is, so again, we can, in depth 1, we just say G shuffle is just our G. And then if we define G shuffle in depth 2 to be our G, plus in the case when the first entry K1 is 1, we add this extra term here, then you can check that due to this formula here, these new objects exactly satisfy this formula here. Um, because in the case when j is 1, um, we get here exactly this factor here. And therefore, um, we can put this into the def definition of g shuffle k um, 1 k minus 1, and therefore this is inside here. <clears throat> and this um, we can do uh, in general. So in general, we can write down an explicit formula um, for this G shuffle in terms of the classical G. So in plus some extra terms. So here these extra terms were given by some derivative. Um, but in general, we need to, so we need to generalize in some sense um, these derivatives, which will lead us to the objects, which we will study also in the, in the, in the last lecture next time. So, namely, what we are interested in is, in, is the following. So these, which we call double index um, G. So we will now define a Q series, which depends on two indices, K1 to KR and D1 to DR. Here we write these Ks on top and the Ds on the bottom. And they will define, be defined uh, as follows. So we take again an ordered sum here. And then here we take these terms with the uh, um, Eulerian polynomials. So if we don't have these terms here, then this would be exactly the definition of the small g for k1 up to kr. But now we also allow some powers of m's here in front, and the exponents are exactly given um, by these d's. So clearly we see that this generalizes the g's in the sense that if everything on the bottom is zero, this is just g, k1 up to um, kr. And um, <clears throat> and they also um, generalize the derivative, which we will talk about next time. But in depth 1, we can see that if I take the derivative q ddq of g k, so what is this? Q, this is q ddq of, uh, so this here is just a definition of of g k. And applying the operator q d d q just means we multiply with this uh, exponent here. And therefore we see that we increase the exponent here of this n. So the exponent of n corresponds to the k. But we will also get a polynomial, in this case just m, in this m here, which then gives the factor there. Therefore this is k times <coughs> m. Oops. Oops. Okay, factorial n to the k q to the m n. So here I just multiplied this with this, and here I factored out this k. Um, and this here, by definition of these double g's, this is just k times g k plus 1, uh, 1. So here, and this is uh, g k uh, 0. So therefore, the derivative of this g k 0 just means we add 1 on both places uh, here and also have some factor depending on this uh, k. So therefore, this derivative here um, could also be written just in terms of um, these double index k's, uh, double index g's. And um, this will be the case in general, meaning that these definitions of these G shuffle, <coughs> we can write down uh, like like this here, um, where the extra terms are not just given by derivatives, by, but by, by these um, double index G. And one fact which we will prove next time is that these double index G, they generate this space um, of modified Q analogs which we defined in section 2. So this was given by 
by all possible modified Q analogs which had arbitrary polynomials in the in the denomin in the numerator. And this ZQ was then defined by the by the span of these polynomials uh, by these by these modified uh, Q analogs. And this um, we will do next time. Um, so I just mentioned this theorem here to say that um, this space ZQ is exactly the space spanned by these double indexed um, G's. And with this um, we can define these G shuffle by using generating series. And for this we consider the generating series of these double G's. So we now have two families of variables here, X and Y. And then this um, German G here is just the generating series of this uh, double G. And then the statement is that this G shuffle can be um, explicitly written down in terms of these generating series of this um, double index G, where we take this sum here. <coughs> so here, um, this um, should look familiar um, to this, what we did in section two, this exponential map in the theory of quasi shuffle algebras. Um, and here, this D is just some um, differential operator which can be written down explicitly. Um, but the statement here, I don't want to go into detail, is just that we can write down an explicit formula for Q series, which we denote G shuffle K1 up to KR, in terms as an explicit linear combination of these um, double index G. And then the statement is that these um, G shuffle, they satisfy the shuffle product. And the proof idea is that um, one considers these generating series H shuffle and then shows that they satisfy um, the correct functional equations which should be satisfied for generating series of objects which satisfy the shuffle product. And for this we use this exponential um, map due to Hoffman. <coughs> And so this is basically this statement here that these um, generating series of this G shuffle um, satisfy the correct um, functional equation, which means that after making some variable change, um, the generating series satisfies this formula here. And further, one can show that this new defined G shuffle equal the small g in the cases when all entries are greater or equal to two. And um, so in DEFS 1, these G shuffles are given like we saw before, um, but now it can be written down a little bit nicer because we can use this double index G. So in DEFS 2, uh, DEFS 2, not DEFS 1. So in DEFS 2, we have that these G shuffle are exactly G, this usual G plus some extra term if G, K2 equals 1. Then we have this G K11, which corresponds to the derivative. But in DEFS 3, we have um, more extra terms which are not just the derivative with respect to q ddq. And then the statement or the definition of these shuffle regularized multiple Eisenstein series is as mentioned at the beginning. We now use this g shuffle to find the head version, meaning we could we put some um, power of 2 pi i in front and then we define this g shuffle as a, a concatenation of these of this contra of coproduct then left hand side is g hat shuffle, right hand side the shuffle regularized multiple zeta values, and then multiplication. And then the theorem is that this um, answers our question from the beginning. So these new shuffle regularized multiple zeta values, uh, these shuffle regularized multiple Eisenstein series, have a Fourier expansion where the constant term is given by the shuffle regularized multiple zeta value, and here some. Uh, complex numbers with real part multi zeta and imaginary part pi, eins, pi times multi zeta. They satisfy the shuffle product formula and they satisfy, uh, they, they are the same as the classical Eisenstein's, multiple Eisenstein series. And yeah, so, so this here is uh, the main part. So to prove this part here, one needs to show that this comparison of the coproduct and the Fourier expansion um, always is the same and therefore one needs to compare these groups of diagrams and these parts um, coming to from, from the calculation of the Fourier expansion by considering all these different words in U and R. And the nice thing is that 
these classical multiple Eisenstein series, which were defined as a sum over ordered lattice points, they satisfy the Stuffel product formula. And these new objects, these sh shuffle regularized, they satisfy the, the, the shuffle product formula. And therefore, we get some linear relations among multiple Eisenstein series. So, for example, if we take the shuffle product of G2 shuffle with G3 shuffle, um, this is the shuffle product. But here, since both indices are greater or equal to 2, we can also write them as a product of the classical Eisenstein series, which satisfies the Stuffel product. And here again, the indices are greater or equal to 2, so we can write them in terms of the shuffle regularized. And therefore, we get this linear relation um, among multiple Eisenstein series, where the constant term on both sides uh, gives also a relation among multiple zeta waves. But here we, we can see that this is just a consequence of these uh, finite double shuffle relations. And yes, <clears throat> so, so maybe this was uh, not really detailed, but you can find the details in the, in the lecture notes and also the definition of the Stuffel regularized multiple zeta values. And next time we will more talk about these double indexed uh, G and talk about their algebraic structure and also um, the behavior of this operator Q DDQ um, on these guys. And yeah, see you then.